I really see some way of, of experiencing uh, hospitality businesses at home as being one of the permanent outcomes from this scenario. I think businesses need to be thinking about this even now and I think it's largely going to bear out that being able to offer some way of enjoying and experiencing and interacting with a hospitality business at home is going to be an essential part of creating a sustainable hospitality business 2021 and onwards. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Amongst all the heartache, the tragedy and the disbelief, one thing that the pandemic has brought to the surface is the fragility and viability of restaurants. Although they are an important aspect of our social interactions, most restaurants live on a knife edge in regards to profitability. What does a sustainable, viable restaurant look like beyond COVID-19? Business person David McIntosh is a partner in Ides, Lee Ho Fook, SPQR Pizzeria and Pope Joan in Melbourne and out in Tokyo. David, how are you going? I'm very well today, Anthony. Thank you. And how are you? I'm good. You've, uh, you're about halfway through this stage four lockdown in Melbourne. What's, what's it like at the moment? Well, the sun is shining today, <laughs> uh, which is new for us. It's been grim weather, um, perhaps to, met, to, to kind of match the local Melbourne mood. Um, but it's, you know what, it's beautiful today. The sky is blue and uh, I went out for my morning run this morning and there's a, a lot of people out and about having their hours exercise. Um, you know, the, the community seems to be largely be playing ball with our obligations. Um, the, the numbers were low this morning, 113 perhaps, I think. Still some sad, you know, news around the number of deaths, but the number of new cases almost at an all-time low. So I feel like that's a little, puts a little spring in people's step down here to think that we're heading in the right direction at the halfway point. You're involved in many businesses, not just restaurants, also in the music industry as well. What's it been like this period of having the first lockdown and then being put into the second one? What sort of impact has that had? I think most people would agree that this second lockdown has been tougher than the first. You know, we really felt like in the first lockdown, there was a sense of purpose um, that we could get through and potentially um, have a window that we could uh, open and get trading again and get back to a normal life. But having to deal with the disappointment of a spike um, and having to go in, into a second lockdown, I think, has really taken the wind out of people's sails, knocked people's confidence around. And I think um, not just in the hospitality industry, but certainly in the hospitality industry, businesses that perhaps made it through the first lockdown um, had a chance to reopen. But I, I, I fear for quite a few people in the hospitality industry that the second lockdown is going to take its toll um, you know, and, the, and that a, a number of people that perhaps had hoped to hang in there at the end of lockdown one now won't be able to do so at the end of lockdown two. The first lockdown allowed restaurants to do takeaway and there was a lot of excitement in the community about being able to access these amazing restaurants at home and um, that allowed them to sell quite a bit of food. But what's it been like in the second period now that the mentality is a little bit different and it's kind of something that they're not that isn't new to them that's right so th there was definitely the inevitable excitement um and i think aligned with that a real willingness on behalf of the general community down here to get behind their local hospitality favorite you know and and to work out a way to support those businesses because they really wanted them to be around at the end of this thing. And uh, I think a lot of people in the community um, pretty quickly did the sums and realized that if they continue to spend a bit of money with their local uh, favorite um, restaurant, cafe, takeaway place, then there was a good chance that they would be around. Um, I think consequentially, um, you know, 
that perhaps, I mean, I think that willingness is still there, but this thing has dragged on and uh, inevitably people are returning to more consistent patterns of food purchasing. It's inevitably a bit more expensive to be buying takeaway, you know, every night of the week. That's got its own economic implications and when people are starting to feel some levels of anxiety uh, in their own personal budgets because they've got issues in their own workplace perhaps um, then they are inevitably becoming a bit more anxious um, I listened to I think the chief operating officer of Coles I think it was on Radio National uh, last week and he was talking about the share of stomach which is this kind of um, business speak for the total revenue that can be associated with a person's tummy and their <laughs> <laughs> their eating habits um, and he was saying that supermarkets are, have actually seen an increase in share of stomach uh, around pantry in particular so he was commenting about the baking phenomenon the the flour the sugar the eggs um, that's but that's seen a huge spike for them and I think um, I think while there are a number of people who are doing their level best to continue to support their um, the local hospitality businesses that is inevitably softening. There's also huge choice now, Anthony. You know, when my one of my businesses, SPQR, we've always offered pizza as a takeaway and on a couple of online uh, home delivery platforms. And our numbers have actually gone down during COVID, um, but because there's probably ten or fifteen times more choice now you know, for for takeaway and home delivery. And, and that's not a criticism, that's just a simple observation that uh, restaurants that restaurants that never contemplated actually doing takeaway or prepackaged meals have had to do so out of necessity and it's created tremendous choice. So, you know, uh, for, for, for some businesses that had that as an ongoing part of the revenue, that's actually softened, which is perhaps surprising, but not when you reflect on it. As I mentioned in the intro, you involved in a partner with a number of restaurants. Have they been impacted differently? Is takeaway working for some of them better? Yeah. So with Pope Joan, for example, we really haven't traded since the 20th of March. Um, it's, a, it's a Melbourne central business district daytime focused corporate audience cafe. We sell hundreds of... We, we used to sell hundreds of coffees, um, really great breakfasts, classic lunches to a largely corporate community. Um, and some of the listeners to this podcast who are Melbourne-based um, will have first-hand experience about what's happened in the Melbourne CBD, which is that not only have we suffered from a general shutdown courtesy of COVID, but the CBD itself... Um, all the workers were instructed to work from home if at all possible and for huge numbers of the city that has turned out to be the case. I mean uh, I can tell you that we, we took um, our usual revenue in the last week of February and in the second week of March we took 15% of that revenue. So wow. Yeah. So it, it fell off a cliff fast um, because not just COVID, but the instructions to work from home meant that the, you know, the 8,000 odd people that work in the towers around us at the top of Collins Street, that all gone by the second week of March. <laughs> and it's just not a business that was suited to um, take away. Uh, and I was quite keen for my staff to actually stay safe. Um, we had a, one of our staff members on was just about to go on maternity leave and you just think, Look, the JobKeeper thing came along, which was difficult to fund at the outset, but um, has largely kept a number of our guys, um, you know, safe at least. So it just didn't make sense. Whereas um, for both Ides with Pete Garn and, and Lee Ho Fook with Victor uh, Leong, there was an audience that was actually quite excited to um, stay connected to those businesses. And both those guys have made their um, at home experience fun, which is, I think, essential 
in these times, Anthony. Um, if you can try and still have some fun with your cooking and fun with because hospitality is meant to be a fun business anyway. You know, it's it's you usually are sitting in a restaurant because you're in a positive frame of mind and and you want a great time with your friends. Um, and so both Peter and Victor have offerings that people have to do some assembling at home uh, and that can be really entertaining if you take it in the right way and if you don't drink too much while you're trying to put the food together it, it can be really fun but um, it can be a bit challenging by the last course if you've had a couple of glasses of wine <laughs> but, um, but it's largely worked out well and, and they've had great responses and they've had a you know they have customers that order every week which is really lovely with SPQR, we actually found a whole new business, um, which we've named From Scratch Dough, and we actually do part-cooked pizza bases for the retail trade. Oh, wow. Yeah. We felt a sense of obligation. We had, I think, three international visa workers with us at SPQR who weren't being offered any support, and obviously lots of people have had lots to say about that. Um, uh, and for us... That's an essential skill for us. We can't make pizzas without um, actually quite highly skilled people, very few of whom um, fit into uh, the rules around um, that support for JobKeeper. So they're mostly international people that have these kind of wood-fired sourdough pizza cooking skills, and, and we had several of them mm. on the staff. So we felt a desire to keep the business going. Uh, we, we couldn't really shut that down and just do the JobKeeper thing there because these three or four people would be left with nothing. Um, but it it's actually turned out to be a fabulous um, thing because we've, we've found this new opportunity which we will stick with um, even when we can open our pizza restaurant again because... It turns out that by doing a slightly better version of a product which people were vaguely familiar with anyway, which is a part cooked pizza base, just do a better version. Um, it's been great. People have really embraced it, and we've got some wonderful grocery stores and um, little independent supermarkets and things that are having a, a, a great success with them. So that's been that's been something positive out of all of this. With with something like that, that will continue on after that's right yeah so if we can get the central business um liverpool street restaurant open again and trading and i'm kind of thinking that might happen perhaps in november then um we can continue to focus on building the, the second um the second part of our business which is that's exciting will the takeaway model continue for lee ho fook and ides do you think beyond covid yeah, and not just for Leho Fook and Ides. I really see um, the some some way of of experiencing uh, hospitality businesses at home as being one of the permanent uh, outcomes from this scenario. I think businesses need to be thinking about this even now, and others have written about it. Um, notably, Adam Lior, I think, wrote an interesting kind of futuristic piece in the guardian a little while ago and that touched on the idea of saying you know how can a customer how can a customer have different experiences with the same business and i you know it was it was prescient at the time and i think it's largely going to bear out that um to a greater or lesser degree being able to offer some way of enjoying and experiencing and, and interacting with a hospitality business at home is going to be an essential part of, of um, creating a sustainable hospitality business 2021 and onwards. No, I don't think there's any question about that. Restaurant models moving forward. What kind of restaurants do you see surviving beyond COVID? And I think the general public don't realise how slim the margins are in hospitality. Do you think that this will change due, due to what's just happened? Mm, so... Look, I think most people are saying that somewhere between 30 and 40% of hospitality businesses won't return, um, which is an enormous tragedy for each of those individual businesses. Uh, so on the one hand, you might argue that that creates more opportunity for those businesses that are still going to continue to operate because there'll be fewer choices for the general public. Um, so perhaps there can be a bit more certainty around pricing. That might be an economic argument to say that 
that might be one way for hospitality to be more sustainable um, in, in the future. Um, but I think uh, I think that the general observation people are making, which I tend to agree with, is that the this sort of fun, fast, casual, uh, everyday knockabout pizza, pasta, burger kind of section of the market should be fine. And that I do genuinely believe that the upper end of the market where there's a real experience uh, and incredible value for money around it being a, a lifelong memory that's generated, uh, I think that fine dining aspect has a lot of potential. Um, the, the middle market's going to be a toughie because that's the sort of places that uh, – you go to on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night when you don't feel like cooking at home and you just feel like a really nice plate of food. Um, and how much of that can be replicated at home by home meal deliveries or, uh, you know, the, the, the replacement meals in the premium grocery store down the road where you can have a similar experience for a bit less. Uh, I think there's question marks around that. Um, but probably to extend the sustainability conversation, I think, Smart hospitality's got to really think about technology now, Anthony. Um, and I think there are players, there are people who are creating technology that is going to be enormously helpful, I think, for future hospitality, whether it's a business like me and you that's got this kind of uh, at-table ordering experience that I think refocuses... Um, front of house staff to be more engaged about the vibe and less about procedural stuff or deputy and tander who are looking after time in attendance and rostering and all that kind of stuff and there's a couple of procurement apps and other bits of technology that are coming um, all of which I think again that you know a hospitality business that wants to be sustainable is going to have to really think about adopting technology where it's appropriate and useful in their business to try and make them more, you know, the user experience more enjoyable, but also the planning, the structure, the reporting uh, is all going to be hugely important, is, is my view of, of what hospitality is going to need to embrace. Um, you know, we sort of got pretty good at it with things like online reservations, right? I mean, I remember my first my first phone call from some people um, seven or eight years ago saying, oh, there's this new business coming and we want to be able to take reservations uh, online and feed into your diary. And I'm thinking, that's a crazy idea. No one's going to want to do that. You know, what are you talking about? No one's going to want to give up their, you know, their little paper reservation book. And, you know, that, that's just the norm now. You just expect to get on your telephone and, book a restaurant and get a confirmation note and and you know that you can go there later that night and the restaurant's expecting you and looking forward to seeing you and it was a totally seamless experience and i think you know the flow on from all of that is is um it's all coming and i think people should be wise to that and and um, get behind it hospitality is not the only sector that uh you're involved in but why restaurants why have you become um, someone that can provide a platform for the likes of uh, Peter Gunn or Victor Leon? I've actually not really had m many other jobs that aren't in the hospitality industry since I um, got my first, you know, bar job back in Auckland uh, when I was supposed to be going to university and doing a, uh, a bachelor <laughs> degree and. <laughs> I was actually really loving what I was doing at night time, interacting with the general public and chatting to them about food and wine and making them drinks and things. I actually really loved it. And uh, the daytime at university, I was scratching my head going, I just can't pick one of these things to really focus on. It wasn't resonating with me. So I just decided that hospitality was going to be my thing. And then when I arrived in Sydney in the mid-90s and I ended up, quite by chance, I'd never heard of Neil Perry before, but I ended up working at Rockpool uh, by reply, I, just, uh, I applied for a job there. Uh, they needed a barman. I got it. Uh, I think because I had a ponytail, and so did Neil. And, um, 
it's just the most inspiring three years of my life. It's absolutely extraordinary, and I still reflect on it all the time. Um, that you can have uh, a person who just kind of opens your mind to quality and produce and where it's from and how you cook properly and how you run a proper restaurant with service and you know um, Rockpool in the mid to late 90s was a remarkable place and when I you know you reflect on the alumni of you know the sort of people that have come through Neil's restaurants over the years they're an incredible bunch of people and they've all gone on to do fascinating um, things and so you know I, I kind of felt like that's what I wanted to focus on um, uh, and I've always had an interest in um, working with talented people, identifying talented people. And, you know, I had the first opportunity I had to do that was um, with Frank Kamora at Movita back in 2002 when I was able to join that group of people and, and help make that business happen in Hosey Elaine with a bunch of other people. Um, and it's been a... Um, a real pleasure along the way to discover um, chefs who have got a real, they've got a willingness and they've got an idea and they've got a talent and they've got drive and determination. And from a business person's point of view, identifying somebody who you know is going to throw themselves 100% into their thing and you know what they need from you and you feel confident that you can provide that most of the time and work in a collaborative way to kind of create this um, new business together is, is a very satisfying thing. And it's the same thing for me. I, I believe very strongly in philanthropic uh, undertaking. So I sit on a couple of boards with mostly arts companies. Um, and one of them in particular, uh, the Australian National Academy of Music, which is an elite sort of, um, performing academy for classical musicians here in South Melbourne sort of has the same approach, which is that they they look to unearth the most talented classical musicians from Australia and New Zealand and give them the most uh, extraordinary practical experience of their life for two or three years in order to help them um, build a career for themselves in the classical music world and it's it's kind of a talent identification game there too of saying well without fear or favor send us your audition and if you're good enough you get to come and wow. in hospitality yeah it's an amazing place but and in business generally i think if you take a view of saying you should be in the talent identification business you should be looking for the best possible people to work alongside i'm a big fan of collaborating i don't own any one business 100 percent outright I don't want to. I don't want to attach 100% of my meaning and value and success or otherwise to one thing. That's a bit scary for me. I like the idea of collaborating with a number of different people and having a number of different things so that, you know, you can sort of share the share the challenges and share the rewards together. It's a, it's a, it's a journey that I like going on, that's for sure. Do you feel like that that... In the opposite to that, in the industry, is a bit of an issue where people throw a hundred percent of themselves into the identity that they get from their one business. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's an all in attitude, and it's. Um, I guess it's one of those approaches where, when it works, it's clearly hugely rewarding because it reflects enormously on you as an individual when you've got this amazingly successful business. I think the risk to that is. When something doesn't work, um, you you run the risk of um, feeling as though you personally have failed. You know, where you might think to yourself, "You personally have succeeded because your business has," and no doubt it's because you've worked your bum off to make it happen, and you had a great idea, and your timing was right. But the downside, and I think that's a real concern in in situations like this, where there will be people sitting at home listening to this, thinking. Uh, this COVID thing was not my fault. My business is, has failed. Um, I've had to let staff go. I've got issues with my landlord. The bank is giving me the shits. None of this is my fault. Uh, and that's absolutely true. But you still are going to feel um, like there's a like it's 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 a failure. Um, perhaps if there are more than one thing that you can be involved in, then 
the, the disappointment in one thing might be moderated by another thing hanging in there or still doing okay. And so, you know, across the board, you might think, well, you know, uh, this th we can we can we can still make something of this. Um, so yeah, I, I am a bit concerned about investing all in in the one thing. I do think that's got a that's got a potential risk category to it. Has that diversification that you like to have as a business person been helpful during the pandemic? Yeah, it has um, because it's meant that uh, I mean, if I was solely invested in Pope Joan, then this would be a really tough time for me right now because it, nothing's happened since the twentieth of March. But because um, because the guys at Ides and the guys at Leho Fook are happily doing their thing and they tell me what they need from me, if anything, on a weekly basis, apart from catch-ups and conversations. and um, But whereas with SBQR and, and the From Scratch Dough side of things, I'm involved in that on an almost daily basis as we kind of strategize and come up with ideas. And, you know, we, we flipped our business to become a wholesale business. So all of a sudden we have all these people that owe us money and the strategy around getting money from customers, <laughs> you know, because in restaurants, if, if nothing else, at least they're positive cash flow. Customers aren't normally allowed to leave until they've paid the bill. Um, whereas <laughs> creating a wholesale business, you're like, where's all the money gone, you know? And then you think, oh, there it is. There's pallets of flour sitting over there. And then I run a, you know, you run an aged debtors report. And even if your customers are on seven or 14 day terms, all of a sudden they owe you 20 or 30 grand or something. You're like, there's all the money. <laughs> so, you know, you end up having really different conversations with your business partners than you used to have when you were running a restaurant um, and learning the new skills of a, of a wholesale um, business, getting out on the road, cold calling, setting up relationships with uh, the likes of the IGA group and things like that where you think, man, in January this year, we were not thinking about trying to get a listing in 15 Richie's IGA stores in Victoria, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> but now we are. You know? So um, I, I think just because there's some diversity in what I do. And then, you know, the other stuff is um, having board meetings with non-hospitality related things like music and other things just to keep the mind oh, engaged and occupied in things that are not hospitality related. But remarkable how the same kind of conversations and the same learnings can be applied across the board actually melbourne's in the lockdown at the moment where the majority of your your restaurants are but you do have out in tokyo what's it been like being restricted to melbourne and and what's going on there um i mean obviously you set up a restaurant in tokyo so that you can come up with a wheeze for why you can go to tokyo four times a year right <laughs> <laughs> um it's a it's a 12 seat uh counter restaurant that serves nothing but fresh pasta, fresh truffles, um, a glass of champagne, a glass of wine, and we only play Led Zeppelin on vinyl. <laughs> <Wow>. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And people talk about concept restaurants. I'm like, mate, have I got a <laughs> don't worry about don't worry about concept restaurants. Um and, you know, Tokyo is probably the only city in the world that a, that a restaurant like that makes sense because there's a kind of a, an appreciation for doing one thing and doing it really well that's a kind of an essential part of Japanese culture and, and the outlook. Um, and just something that a business partner and I really, really wanted to do and we were blessed that his sister was prepared to live in Tokyo and make this thing come true. Um, and it's it's actually similarly challenging in Tokyo although Tokyo hospitality is open but we can only be open until 10 o'clock at night there's some restrictions around that um, but um, not being able to go up there is frustrating because it's um, it's it's a city that I've come to love very much and it's a really inspiring place to be you learn a great deal in a place like that and being able to sit and have a conversation with your business partner in the venue is, is essential. Um, and so we're sort of resorting to Zoom and Google and all the rest of it, um, which is much less satisfying. Um, uh, you know, it's got its challenges. Landlords been great. Government's actually been remarkable in Tokyo. They've been uh, at the forefront of business support 
up there. But, you know, we, we similar to the conversation you and I were having a few minutes ago, we were talking about to what extent does the home dining experience have a future in hospitality? I look at a business like Out in Tokyo and I just immediately see a future where you've sat in out, you've had your pasta, you've had your truffle, you had a great glass of wine, and the natural next thing is to have a look at the cabinet on the wall and grab a few packets of fresh pasta and grab a fresh truffle and a couple of bottles of wine and take it home with you. And I think that that has got to be the natural next step. Um, back to Adam Lior's thing, actually, which is, you know, sign up for the next special occasion we're doing, take these pre-packed things home with you, interact with our business in more than the one way that we used to be able to do so. You know, it's, it's essential. And it'll be easier for some businesses than others, no doubt, but got to think about it. How has this experience affected you? You like to get involved with really creative people and create amazing things, but has this shone a new light on the industry for you? Uh Look, it's, an, it's, it's a resilient industry and I, I think there's a number of people in, in our industry who really couldn't do anything else. This is the thing they just must do. This is their calling. Um, I think there are a lot of creative artists in the hospitality industry uh, and, you know, so th this goes beyond job. It goes beyond business. It, it's, it's, um, it's their thing. It's, it's their definition of who they are as a person and it's what they must be doing. So they'll find a way. Um, yeah, it's look. I <laughs> it's it's difficult, isn't it? In, in the middle, still in the middle of these things, and still trying to pick the future. Anthony is 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 very very difficult. But there there will be there will be an industry, and there will be creative people in it. Um, now's a time for uh, self reflection and planning. And without sounding trite, it's actually an important time to keep mental well-being and physical well-being in good shape and keep those things aligned, getting some perspective. Uh, in Melbourne at the moment, we're allowed an hour's uh, exercise outside. Um, so, you know, you got you just got to take those little things. And you know, if you can wrangle an hour's shopping and turn that into another bit of exercise and shopping, then all to the good. But, you know, it's the... the, the, the the balancing of the creative thought, the creative mind, the creative process, along with health and well-being, uh, is all essential. There was uh, one stage a couple of weeks ago that on Twitter you mentioned it was a calling for perhaps going into elimination uh, to get on top of this thing and without being able to predict the future. How are you feeling at the moment about the reopening and when that may be and you know whether elimination should have happened? Yeah, I'm still a I'm still a supporter of the elimination strategy. Uh, I watched what happened in New Zealand um, back in March. I have family there, um, and I thought that by going hard and going early, uh, appreciating that their circumstances were different, they had far fewer community transfer cases and all the rest of it. But I, I felt that they got on top of things very quickly, um, and I think. I actually think the hospitality industry is one of those industries that stands ready to assist in an elimination strategy. I think I've made the observation in public before that, um, you know, I think we, we're we pretty good actually at um, looking after people. We're pretty good at putting in some regulations and some health requirements and obligations. We're pretty good at sanitizer, taking people's names. We know who's in our venue we can do appropriate training with our staff. Um, and I, I like to think that the hospitality industry can play an essential role sooner rather than later. I, you know, I, I, you, we've seen that large gatherings in people's private homes has been an issue. Uh, and that's not surprising in the slightest because, of course, you want to hug and kiss and, you know, be close to your family and loved ones. It makes perfect sense, but it's also potentially dangerous, whereas in a hospitality sitting in a professional environment where uh, you're just not going to go there if you're feeling poorly anyway and if you do you arrive and you give your name and your contact details and you're encouraged to wash your hands and sanitize and sit uh, with some social distancing and all the rest of it I, I actually think we're an industry that could potentially respond 
in the elimination strategy. The elimination strategy doesn't mean that from time to time there will be flare-ups. That's an inevitable um, part of the deal. But I think, you know, if you look at the New Zealand scenario, they've recognised that too. What they are able to do is to respond quickly to what are relatively small uh, flare-ups. If you've largely got rid of it in the community, then you're just dealing with spot fires. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I still think that it's... I still think it's a great goal to achieve, and I think large parts of Australia actually have achieved it, really, Anthony. You know, look at WA, the Territory, South Australia, Tasmania, Queensland to a greater or lesser degree. I really think we're talking about Victoria and New South Wales um, as being the, the states that have had a tough run with some frustrating situations around quarantine and one thing or another, but... Um, I, you know, as a country, you've got to feel like we're, there's some, we're pretty close uh, yeah. to, to, to getting largely on top of the numbers. Um, yeah. It's a time for self-reflection. Is, is there some positives that you're going to take out of this experience? Uh, yeah, I'd like to think so. <laughs> I, I certainly hope so. Um, yeah, look, I think, I think, I think there's, I think there's without. I want to sound kind of blasé about this, but I, I do think that 2021 might be a pretty fantastic year. Actually, I think if we can get on top of this thing, um, if we can keep the numbers low, if a vaccine uh, it makes itself available, and or we largely eliminate this thing, we could see quite an exciting time. You could see people coming out of their homes and really wanting to reconnect with their community. Um, I personally am you know, gutted that I can't go and see music. You know, I can't go and see a band at the pub. I can't go to the opera. I can't go to any symphony thing. You know, there's just massive paucity in, in a person's cultural life right now. And I feel like the moment we're able to do that again, I think that's just going to be huge. Um, and getting the chance to sit down and share a glass of wine and a meal with dear friends that we haven't seen any other way than a computer screen for a year, um, <laughs> it's going to be big as well. Uh, so, I, you know, if, if there's fewer hospitality businesses that are open next year, but a real resurgence of people wanting them, then, you know, the positive side of me thinks, you know, it could be quite a year. Um, uh, and as long as, um, as long as the health crisis has largely been dealt with, then we can get on with the economic recovery through, um, you know, positive reconnection with the industry again. That would, and I, I don't think that's impossible, personally. Well, I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Dave, you've been bloody amazing. <laughs> it's a pleasure to, to chat to you, Anthony, and c congratulations on what you've done with these podcasts. I think they've been. There's a positive outcome from this thing, right? That people have got to share their experiences and listen to people's personal take on these things. And I think that's a great thing. So congratulations to you. Well, well, thank you. And um, we're honoured to have you on. And um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Nice to chat. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>